I'll never forget uh, the conversation I had with a buddy one day and the way it was set up. We do a luncheon in Dallas with about 250, sometimes 300 uh, business leaders. And a buddy came up to me after one of these lunches and he said, John, could I meet with you? And I said, well, sure. I didn't know what the deal was. So he uh, came in a couple weeks later and he said, it's not about me. It's about my daddy. He said, my daddy lives in Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and said he's 70 years old. He's a brilliant man. He's been a great daddy, but he's got a problem. He has cancer. But even more than that, he claims to be an atheist. And he said, what breaks my heart is I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He doesn't. So when it's all over here on this planet, we're not going to be together. And I'd like to see something happen in his life with his faith. And I said, well, listen, why don't you uh, tell him I'll fly up to uh, Charlottesville and spend a, a day or two with him next week, but he doesn't know me, so you're going to have to get his approval. So that was on a Friday. On Monday, I came to my office, and there was an email from Rob, and he said, uh, I talked to my dad, and my dad said, well, Rob, if it's that important, I'll come to Dallas. So that next Tuesday, at precisely 10.15 in the morning, in walks Bob and Rob. Bob the dad, Rob the son. I have to be honest with you, I didn't know if I was really going to like this guy or not, because sometimes people that take the atheistic position can be, uh, well, what's the right term here? Uh, they can uh, be rather obstinate and not a whole lot of fun to be around. This guy was delightful. Gave him a big hug. He came in. We sat down. We visited for a while. And then finally I said, Bob, i got to ask you a question. Why are you here? He said, well, I'm here because Rob asked me to come, and he said it was important. Good answer. Number two, what do you believe? He thought for a second, and then he said, well, I guess I would have to say I believe in the inherent goodness of mankind. I started laughing. I said, Bob, obviously, you don't know some of the mankind I know. He said, well, you're probably right about that. I said, third question, do you believe there's a God? He put his head down. A couple of seconds later, came up, and he looked at me right in the eyes, and he said, I'm not sure about that. I said, okay. I said, let me tell you where we need to start. We need to start with the question of existence. How in the world did we get here? And so I said, there are only three possible answers. And I said, I'm going to do this very briefly, Bob. We're not going to get tangled up in this, but let me tell you what the three are. Number one, everything that exists today has always existed and came out of absolutely nothing. So I hit the wall behind me and I said, pretend this is a black blackboard. And I said, everything this theory says came out of nothing, but nobody accepts that theory because it doesn't give you any specific answers to the specific questions we have about this theory and existence. Second possible answer is everything that exists has always existed, but with possible cycles within. In other words, formula-wise, it's time plus chance equals existence. I said, this is where you'd find Darwin, this is where you'd find evolution, etc. I said, it's very interesting, by the way, when uh, Darwin was on his deathbed, Darwin had some of his friends there, and he said, you know, I was a proponent of the theory that everything eventually evolved from an earthworm. But what bothers me and depresses me at this stage of my life is, if I came from an earthworm, then how can I trust myself to come up with a theory that explains the existence of mankind, and they said he died depressed. Third possible answer, there's a personal beginning. And so I said, Bob, I said, when you flew down here yesterday, I said, you came out of that beautiful country up there in Charlottesville, Virginia, gorgeous country. You came down and you got into Arkansas and it started to flatten out a little bit. You got down to Texas, it got real flat. You came right on into Dallas. Here's the question. As you looked at all of this and thought about this over the years of, of what's on this planet, if, if, if there were a God who made all this, what would he have to be like? He said, well, he'd have to be powerful. He'd have to be intelligent. Somehow he'd have to communicate. And he'd name four or five things. I said, Bob, let me ask you a question. Are you intelligent? He said, well, I, I pride myself in being pretty smart. I said, uh, can you communicate? He said, well, my wife would argue about how well I do on that one. And I said, well, um, do, you have, do you have some kind of creativity in your mind and how you do what you do, et cetera? And he said, yeah, I'm fairly creative. I named five or six more things. 
I said, Bob, there's a verse in the Bible that says we have been made in the image of God. After his likeness, we have been made. Do you realize that everything you said God would have to be like is exactly what you're like? There is a match. And Bob had never heard that before. He literally just sat back and began to ponder that in his mind. I said, Bob, let me ask you a question. Why in the world is the world so screwed up and messed up? He said, that's a good question. I said, well, let me give you a little history. Do you mind if I give you a little history on it? He said, no, no, that's, that's fine. I said, years ago, in the very beginning, God created those first two people that he made. And I said, um, he basically set them in a situation environmentally where every need they had was met. There were no storms, there were no disease, there were no tsunamis, everything was perfect. One day, though, they decided they wanted to run their own lives. And he had set up a lot of rules. He had one rule. And it was for their good, not to keep them from having a great time and a fulfilled life. And so they decided they wanted to go their own way, and they said, we're going to do that. And they did. As a result of that, Bob, four things happened that not only impacted them, but through the years have come all the way down to where we are today and impact us. First of all, they were cut off from God. They were disconnected from God. And I reached over when I was talking to Bob, and I pulled a the, the cord out of the wall that was connected to a lamp, the light went out. I said, why did it go out, Bob? He said, because there's no power. Exactly. We're disconnected from God. The second thing that happened to them and us is we're cut off from ourselves. There's nobody on the planet today that has it all together in terms of how they look at themselves and their significance and their importance, etc. Number three, the third thing that happened was they were cut off from others. I said, look at the divorce rate in our country. Look at the fact that we have wars. Look at the fact that we have to have attorneys and sign contracts. We just can't shake somebody's hand and do what we say we agree to do. So there's a relational problem with other people. But finally, everything in creation has been thrown off kilter. And now we have natural disasters and we have disease. And people, Bob, get cancer. Why is the world so messed up? I think that's the reason why the world is so messed up, and that's the kind of world we live in, a fallen world, and with the fallout that comes by living in that fallen world. So, Bob, do you think there's any hope? Is there any hope? And Bob looked at me, and he shook his head like, I don't know. And I said, Bob, let me, let me, give, you, um, let me give you some hope. I said, you like football, Bobby? Oh, I love football. So we talked about football for a second. I said, Bob, how many downs are there in football? He said, well, there are four downs. Exactly. Just as in football there are four downs, there are four downs that will help us remember what God has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. Down one, God looked down. And when he saw the mess on this planet, he literally, the Bible says, could have turned his back on humanity and said, I've had it with you. But he didn't do that. Down two, Jesus came down. God, the Bible says, put skin on. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in a body, came on this planet, lived for 33 years. When he spoke, people didn't go to sleep. They listened to him. When he touched people, he made them whole. But he didn't come just to do that. The third down is that Jesus laid down his life on a cross. Why did he do that? And surely you know something about that. He said, well, yeah, I've heard about that before. I said, well, the Bible says not only are we cut off from God, but we're cut off for a reason. And the thing that blocks us from God and keeps us alienated from him is that we've offended God. The Bible calls that sin, a spiritual cancer. The Bible also says not only have all people sin and come short of what God expects, but it also says that the wages of sin is death. And so therefore, that penalty, those wages, have to be dealt with. Here's God's plan, Bob, in a nutshell. He comes down in the form of a perfect person, Jesus Christ, God in a body, puts him on a cross. He dies on that cross, and God's plan was to put on him what I am due. What I am due is to be separated from God forever. He paid the penalty. So, Bob, that's, uh, that's pretty much the story. And you might have heard some of that over the years, but there's one more down. 
And Bob, the last down is that every knee must bow down. There comes a point in our lives where we have to see our position and our relationship with a holy God. And that we have to see there's no way to get to him by being religious. And by the way, Bob, all religions are essentially the same. They basically say, keep the rules of our religion, cross your fingers, and hope somehow, someway, you'll be good enough to make it to God. But it's all dependent upon how good I am and how well I keep those rules of that religion. And we can never keep them well enough. So, the question is, are you willing to say, Lord, I can't make it to you? So, Bob, I've got one more thing I want to do. I want to put a big circle in front of you, and I want you to imagine that this circle is your life. It represents you. The way this thing works, the Bible says, is that if Christ is going to work in you, he's got to live in you. The scripture says, I think it's in John 1, 12, to as many as received him, to them gave he the right, gave he the right to become a son of God. And so therefore, Bob, he's got to live in you. So I'm going to put a cross outside that circle, and here's my question. If that cross represents everything I just told you about what Jesus did, where is he in relationship to you? Is he out there? Is he getting closer? Or is he inside you? Bob thought for a moment, and he looked at me, and being very honest, he said, he's out there. I said, Bob, I don't know if you're ready to do this or not, but I'm going to pray a little prayer. And if you would like to ask Christ to come into your life, it's totally up to you. And there's no magic in my words. It's just to facilitate and help you to make this transaction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a little prayer. You can close your eyes, you and Rob, and, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. So they bowed their heads, and I said a prayer like this. Dear Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my life now. Clean me up, and from this day forward, help me to become the man you've always wanted me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I looked up, and the guys, Rob and Bob, still had their heads bowed. And I want to be honest with you at this moment. I mean, I could literally reach across the coffee table and touch them. I looked at them, and I said, you know what? I didn't say this to them, but I thought this. Those suckers went to sleep on me during my prayer. And then I leaned over and I said, Bob, 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 did you pray that prayer? And very slowly, his head came up and he shook his head, yes, and he began to weep. At that point, Rob, who's a crybaby anyway, saw his daddy weeping. They stand up, father and son, hug each other, embrace each other, because a man came into that room that day who was dead, the Bible says, and came alive. And so, the question today is, is Christ in your life? And if he is in your life, are you committed to helping other people know the good news I've just shared with you? Because everyone, everyone on the planet needs a way to deal with our greatest dilemma, our greatest problem, and that is sin. And only Jesus provides an answer to that problem. So, what are you gonna do about that? Make sure he's in your life and then pass that on.